Uh, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Nick Harmer from the University of Exeter. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for your interest. I'm going to be talking today about using automatically generated personal data sets uh, for, stu for student assignments. So the background to this problem was that in previous years, we've run a lab report assignment for our second years, which was a bit difficult this year because we couldn't get them to collect any data. And in this lab report assignment, what they were doing was we gave them three proteins from a set of 10 that they were told the proteins would come from. They would use some uh, protein purification techniques to separate those proteins. And then they would collect some analytical data on the proteins some of which was numerical data and some of which was graphical data in terms of a protein gel. And then their task was to use that data to go back and work out which three proteins we'd given them in the first place. In most years, what we, we would do this, we would get the students to work with their own data and then we would help them to do the analysis. But this year, obviously, they couldn't collect data. I had some examples from previous years, lots of the gels images, which was the most helpful, but not very much the numerical data. And there wasn't going to be enough data to give each student the, their own data set or indeed to avoid having to give quite a lot of students the same data. From our past experience, if the students end up having all the same data, then we tend to find that what happens is that a small number of them end up being doing the analysis and everyone else piggybacks off their efforts, which is not the most helpful. The solution that I came up with this was to use an R script to generate individual data sets for the students based on the existing data that I had. So the idea was that it would look like the real data that we collected, but that it would be individual. Uh, it would have errors built into it so that each student would get something that looked independent and novel. And hopefully, therefore, they would then be able to do their own analysis without having to, uh, without having to feel that it has to be the same as everybody else's. And indeed, what we found was that the, the students at first were a little bit surprised that they couldn't go and check their answers with a friend, but instead they were going to have to do the analysis for themselves because they couldn't rely on their answers being the same as for somebody else's. The code for this was about 130 lines of R in total. My R is not the best, so I would imagine that someone who's an expert in R could easily get that right down. It took me about I think for this one, about five or six hours to write. Again, someone who's more used to using R, I think could do it an awful lot quicker. And certainly doing it a second time later in the module, we were able to get it down quite a lot in terms of time. So what the students get is they get a report form that looks something like this. It tells, tells them what their student number is, just in case they've just clicked on somebody else's by mistake. And then they get some data and then they got got all of the data that they would normally get in the laboratory experiment. Obviously, what we also did for them was we made them some videos so that we could go through the experiment and see exactly what the experiment normally looks like. Um, and that was with me demonstrating each of the key steps in the experiment, and then some videos explaining what we want in the report so that they could know exactly what we were expecting to see if they did the analysis properly. As part of this, the script generated a report for the student, but it also generated a report for the marker, because obviously, as every student was getting their own data, it's not always possible for the markers to know what they should be getting. And because I mark some of these and a colleague marks some as well, I did not want to leave my colleague having to go around trying to interpret the outcome of my interesting model. So for every student, there's a marker sheet that came out that's available, which shows what results they ought to get if they do their analysis properly. And this means that we can get, uh, ours very good for this, it means we can get a very nice graphs for all the graphs that they ought to get, and we can get an answer that they should get as well. So the student response to try and help this was, we gave them a technique video, which was produced maybe 20 minute video, trying to go through the experiment very quickly as we might have done it. And then we ran two question and answer sessions for them where we invited them to ask questions via Padlet and a sample of the questions is there. And then we would answer the questions via a video, obviously, as we weren't able to meet in person to do this. 
we found that by the end of the second of those two sessions that, that were run live, we'd pretty much exhausted all the questions. The questions that we got were very similar to the questions we normally got. In some respects, I would say that because we had put more effort into the upfront preparation, we got less trivial questions about simple things they should really have known and more higher level questions about how they should do, do things and, and quite insightful questions about the experiments themselves. The main thing that we did see from the feedback was that they didn't like it, that they couldn't check their, ans yeah, check their answers with a friend, uh, meaning the, the ones who aren't so confident doing analysis, asking somebody else to kind of make sure they've done it right. In terms of outcomes, this, this, this is the, the scores. So what we see compared with four previous cohorts of students, the means look pretty much on a par. The mean is, I think, definitely within error of the previous three years. But what we really see is that there's a much bigger spread in the marks. Um, and the students who've done really well, have probably the, the best reports are right at the top end of what we've seen before. But we've seen a lot more students scoring poorly, particularly, although, although there's always a couple of very poor ones, actually what we're seeing is we're seeing there's, there's more in this kind of 50s range and more in the 70s range. So we, what we've seen is the, the outcome of doing it this way is that we get a much bigger spread than we normally would in terms of that. I think that really boils down to if the students are engaging well, they're scoring very well. And because I know that the data are good, no student has got data which are difficult to interpret. And when they use their own data, sometimes the data are not the easiest to interpret um, because of how they've set it up. It means that the good students are not ever being in that situation where they're held back by their data, but the ones who haven't engaged have found it much harder. So I would say in terms of pros and cons, the big advantage was we were able to give students an assignment, whereas if we hadn't had used this, I think we would have been really struggling because we just didn't have the data to give students an assignment, not without uh, an unbelievable amount of work. It meant that I could pre-screen all the data to make sure they're interpretable. So every student had what I would call good data. Um, in one case, there was a in one case there was a specific issue with the data set, but because it was automatically generated, I could sort out that issue with the data set very quickly, and the student was able to get a very nice out outcome very very quickly, and we could sort that out without any problems. And I would say, as I said earlier, because we're confident the data were good enough to work with, we were dealing with a lot more higher level queries in questions and answers, and far fewer queries that were along the lines of, have I done my experiment wrong, essentially, um, which, which is usual. For, as a marker, it's a lot easier to mark an assignment where there's a crib and I can look and see exactly what the student ought to be getting and be confident that that is right. And that if, if the student doesn't get that, that's because they've misunderstood what they're doing quite badly. In terms of the costs, writing the code, as I say, took several hours. Students go, don't get to use their own data. And I think we see that students not using their own data in some cases are engaging much less well with this than usual. Will we do it again? I would say yes. Um, we, we've already decided that we're gonna do it again for another assignment because we, we found that this is, a, this is a good way to make sure that students have to work with their own numbers and that they're not going to use uh, piggyback off other people's work. So that that's the end of my presentation. So I'd be really happy to take any questions if anybody has any. I'm going to stop sharing now. Brilliant, thank you. Nick, that's a great way to kick off. Uh, we got a question from David. It said, uh, do you think that the poor students could not be dragged up by peers that know how to do the analysis? Are they not sharing the concept of it rather than the data? I, I think that they probably are. I, I'm, I'm very confident that they would, that they probably are doing that. Um, I think that at least if they're having to do some of the work for themselves, that that will ho hopefully uh, reduce the, well, increase the amount of benefit that the, the weaker students are getting from that process. Um, certainly in the past when we've done it in groups, if somebody can work it out, then they, they've got the full answers basically. And we do sometimes see reports where you look at it and go, yeah, you've got the right answers, but I'm not sure your explanation for why you've got them makes sense. 
Um, whereas here, because every student's getting a different outcome um, and they can't be sure they've got the same outcome as anyone else's, it does mean that they, even if they're getting somebody else to work through it with them, they have to go through and write and write their explanation for how they got there. And it becomes very rapidly obvious if they're not really sure how they got there. But um, I, I, I agree. I mean, in some ways, if they if someone's struggling and they get another student to help them, that that's probably better than them floundering. Um, so and they probably learn. So I'm pretty happy with it getting there. Yeah. So application of the knowledge as well as just the the interpretation of it. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Um, I've had a uh, question Noel. from Noel as well. So do you think that even if you go back into the labs, you'd get them to generate their data as practice, but then use data for the write-up so that you can combine what you've done so it's not lost in the future? Uh, that's a good question. That's one we're going to have to work on um, as to whether we, 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 whether we decide that we'll recycle this as practice for the students and say this is what the data you might get and use it almost like a pre-lab um, assignment or whether we go in and say you collect your own data but um, we'll give you this that that's a future discussion and I think we'll we'll probably wait till our module review to decide on that um, I, I I think most likely what we'll do is we'll use it for well I don't know I don't I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm not the module lead so I think I don't have I think I might uh, let my colleague also have a say in that one before I go to it. I, I think there's pros and cons both ways. Yeah, okay. Um, um, we got a sort of a, a question and a comment from Ian, which I think relates more to your, your Q&A sessions. But um, he says, I'm seeing reports of increased or at least on par student engagement with the opportunity to ask questions. However, I'm interested if remote has offered opportunities for a more diverse range of questioners. Has anybody seen or have evidence to show us students who do not normally ask questions in classes and now doing it? And I think this is something that we can visit now, but also maybe at the end when all of the, the contributors can maybe answer that as well. I would say our experience is using the Padlets, we're seeing a very different range of students ask questions. Um, in the Q&A sessions, we, we, when we're asking, offering people the chance to do it live, uh, we probably do get the same ones. Who, the, the, the ones who would ask questions all the time are much more happy doing it live, but also doing it through Teams with the chat. Some people ask questions who definitely wouldn't put their hands up. Um, but I think having having anonymous questions uh, has definitely made people who wouldn't normally ask questions ask questions. Uh, that's certainly, certainly my experience. That is an anecdote, though. I don't think we've got enough. I don't think I've seen enough to know whether that's a general trend, but it's a really good question. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, and then we've got a question from Jeffrey as well. said, uh, could you give out one poisoned experiment and ask students to suggest what went wrong, assuming they can ident identify the protein from the other data they receive? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we would have to redesign what we did here because the way it was set up was designed so that they had more or less the minimum information necessary to 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 get the right answers. So, I think we we would be in a situation where we need to give them another piece of information, or possibly even two, to be able to unpick where the poison experiment was. So that's a really good idea, though. That would be really cool. Um, so that that is that that's a really a really cool idea um i think we probably need to give them a bit more but we could we could definitely consider it that's definitely a really good idea for incorporating that in the future um yeah 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 that goes back to sort of the the, the sort of the far eastern method of teaching maths doesn't it of giving yeah. a solution when it's not possible to get to that solution and asking <laughs> to why what's gone wrong which is yeah great yeah. Way. yeah 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 it's a great idea though yeah, I mean, I put I put errors in, but the errors were designed to replicate a good experimental student. Um, so a student who was performing at probably like the 80th percentile of of talent, um, and that's that's kind of okay. But I think, yeah, we, if if with the way we set it up, if we made it worse, we wouldn't. So in, too many students would have just thrown their hands up. <laughs> But it's a good idea. 
and sort of really a comment from Mel, but also a question I was going to ask is you said that you had some experience of coding in R. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't have experience in coding in R, is this something that you, that you think they could do, or albeit it would take them a lot longer, or is there guidance on how to write a script like this? Um, uh, the, I, I would say it's definitely definitely going to take longer if you haven't got experience. I, I've got limit. I have limited coding experience, um, and again, I use R because I was pretty confident I could get it to do what I wanted. Um, Python, I'm sure, would do the same. I just, I'm my Python's worse than my R, so I wasn't confident I could do it quickly. Um, I think it's one of those things where it wouldn't be difficult to make a how-to because there's nothing I use that was at all complicated. I think if you've got not much experience with coding, then you probably find it really frustrating just because of the, um, uh, just the conceptual problem. But I think if you've done any coding, then with a how-to, it would be relatively easy to set up. I think um, just inadvertently volunteered yourself to write a how-to guide for the lecture remotely website, Nick. So, um... Yeah, yeah. It, on, on, the, on, on that day when it's uh, when when it when I, I haven't got any marking to do, which was yeah, be, that'd be, yeah, that'd be. but but it's yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. Um, I completely agree with David. The the bio the biochem sock intro to R. They've got I've done a couple of I've basically done my training off their courses. Okay. Um, biochem sock's brilliant for that. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, I, I did their Python course over the uh, lockdown, and that was great as well. So yeah. Brilliant. Okay, Nick, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure there might be more comments or questions that pop up in the chat that you can engage with.